Hey everyone, this is Zephyr, with an advanced dungeon draft tutorial on being able to change the entire look, feel, and theme of your maps quickly and easily using the text editor. Like I've done with the tower here, I can add a sandstone theme and change the colors drastically to give the map a whole new feel. This is a real game changer for being able to add different versions of your maps efficiently and easily. We can change colors regardless of the opacity of different objects and remove the shadows from them if we accidentally place them with the built-in drop shadows, alter textures and colors radically, and even change the file paths like those of walls without ever having to open Dungeon Draft itself. This is all possible with the power of text editing, as all Dungeon Draft maps are JSON files. To go through this, I've set up an example dungeon draft map that includes examples of different walls using the exact same file path for the image, with a variation in hex codes that we're going to change later, and a different type of wall that will also be able to change all of these walls to match, as an example of being able to swap around file paths. I also have set up a level that has pattern shapes that we will also be changing and we'll be able to see how we can change colors with hex codes that are used across different levels, but keeping those changes isolated. And we also have objects to demonstrate how these changes will carry through regardless of opacity and regardless of object type. For the first example, we're going to go through changing the file path for a wall. So we're starting with this wall brick earthy A, and that's on all of these different colored variants and we're going to be changing it into this leaning castle wall down at the bottom. Now, to make these changes, we're not actually going to go through and click and manually swap them. I've created a notepad that has some of the information about my objects with their hex codes and this path that I have for the wall brick or the A. I really recommend as you make maps in Dungeon Draft that you keep a notepad like this so that you have this as reference, not only when you're building additional levels and you need to remember what you used, but also when you're going in to do these text editing tricks. So I have that. I'm gonna go into my text editor of choice to be able to open up this Dungeon Draft map. I really like Notepad++ for this. It's a lot easier because you can specify a language. So if I right click on this D text editor example, I can instead choose to edit this with Notepad++ or open it with a regular Notepad. And we'll see that this is a JSON file and it has all of these different brackets for grouping up the levels, etc. So in Notepad++, if I go to my language and select JSON, it's gonna add some highlighting and there's these little pips with minuses and pluses for code folding that will allow me to collapse things and navigate this very easily. The header is the general information about the map itself and includes some various points, for example, your grid settings and the texture that you use for it. And embedded, we'll get back to later, but that's if you drag and drop any other images into your maps. Levels and the world is where all of the data for your map itself live. So here I am on my level two, and that is my walls level. You can change the label here. You can adjust the baked lighting, which is just showing that there is lighting being powered by Dungeon Draft. And that's how you can add hue shifts. You have your layers, which specified all of the layers that you can place on. And then we have our tiles, which is not going to be a whole lot of interest on this particular one. The pattern section defines the different pattern shapes on the level. And finally, we have the walls. Each of the walls has the texture specified, that's the image. The points show the X1, Y1, and then X2, Y2 positions. If you reverse this, you change the direction that the wall flows. For example, if there's wood on one side versus the other, that will depend on the direction. So you can just flip it by switching the order of these two coordinates. We have the color, which specifies the hex code. The first two digits always specify the opacity. And again, this is in hex, so it's hexadecimal. FF is 255 out of 255 for the possible values. 
The following six are indicating the red, green, and blue values. There's two digits for each of those. So changing those will change the color. Loop is set to false. That's if you have a circle. And then we have the shadows, which show whether there's a drop shadow or not. And there's a section that would define portal as if we had portals attached to it. We're going to change the file path here on these wall brick earthy A's. So we have the texture that we uh, are going to replace. And the texture we want is this castle wall leaned wall. We'll notice that they're from different packs and have different file structures. So we do need to replace that entire string instead of just the last bit with the PNG. So to do that, I'm opening up my find and replace with control F, going to the replace tab, and I'm pasting in what I want to replace in the find what. And in replace, I'm going to select the file path for the castle wall lean wall and put it in the replace with line. Note that because these are in different packs, it's important that in my uh, header under my asset manifest that I actually have that pack. And we will see that down here with FA assets DV3.03 that ID matches. And if I didn't have this loaded, then the map wouldn't know to go ahead and load that pack. So you need to have that in there. It's probably easiest to add that by opening the map in Dungeon Draft and saving it rather than pasting in that information here. But once we've confirmed that, we can replace individually, or we can hit replace all and replace every single wall earthy A in the map with this castle wall leaned wall. I'm going to save as here and save it as a edited version. You should make backups of your maps. Occasionally, if you accidentally delete the wrong thing, you can break your map. So always make a backup. And if you change this to all file types, you're able to save it as a dungeon draft map instead of a .json. Once we've saved this, we'll open up our new map in dungeon draft, and we'll see now that all of these walls that were the earthy A are now specified as the castle wall leaned wall. And we were able to do this without having to do the normal manual process of scrolling up and selecting the new wall and then having to redo the hex code again. So this was significantly faster and more efficient, particularly if we have a lot of walls. You can imagine that if you have a whole map using the same wall type that you're going to replace, that this would be significantly faster. Next, let's remove those pesky drop shadows. A lot of times I forget to turn off the drop shadows as I'm placing things, and I really don't like how they look, especially since I manually do my shadows. To do that, you'll notice that all of the walls and all of the objects have a line called shadow, and you set the value to true or false. By default, it's true. I'm going to change it to false to get rid of all of them. So here I'm just pasting in shadow colon true for the find what, and I'm replacing it with shadow colon false, and I'm going to replace all. And one thing that's important to note here is that even though I had level zero, which is my objects collapsed, it has popped open because it contained the lines shadow, uh, shadow true on there. So it went ahead and opened that up. So this will apply to my entire map when I'm doing this. So it's a very nice trick to make sure you've gotten all of those gone if you notice that you had your drop shadows on at some point. And opening Dungeon Draft back up, we'll see that not only do our walls have no shadows, but our objects have no shadows. It's really easy to tell with the grid off, but there are no more built-in drop shadows coming down. Next, we have these different hex codes, and again, I have gone ahead and copy and pasted them over. These are pretty easy since they're simple and they're all kind of major values of red, blue, green, cyan, magenta, and yellow. And I'm going to change some of these. Returning to my text editor, I am going to go through and update all of the green in this map. There is some green specified in patterns and in the walls, and I'm going to demonstrate again that even if you have certain things collapsed, it's going to make the changes throughout the whole map if it can find them, unless you specify something different. So this color is specifying the tint for this particular pattern shape, and it's color FF00FF00, so that's 100% opacity, no red, all the green, no blue. 
And I'm going to replace this with a much lighter green. And I'm going to make it um, B6 FF B6. I just know that B6 is a fairly high value there. And it's right around the meaty part of the colors. So if I were to do B6s all across, it would tend to darken things a little bit. So here, this is going to end up being slightly brighter because I'm increasing the color value of red and blue, but the green was already turned all the way up. So the higher the values you have, the closer to white you get. And again, I can go through and do the fine next replace, or I can do replace all. And I'm just looking through and you can see that it's replaced everywhere, but it's not replaced uh, these other bits for the blue. And here I'm going to go ahead and replace blue. And you can notice that if I do this in selection, this is how I can make sure that changes to blue only happen on this level with patterns. And you can select and drag down for that, or you can make sure that you hit just this entire level by collapsing it and selecting from one all the way down to the beginning of two without including two itself. That'll make sure you're only making changes within one rather than affecting other levels. I think it's important to have that in selection tick box. And if we replace all, then we should have changed all of the blue on our pattern shape level, but not the blue on our walls, despite them having the exact same hex code. And again, that's because we use the in selection. That's a really powerful tool if you're trying to only affect one level, or if, say, on a level you want to change the hex code for your objects, but not your walls, even though they share some hex codes. And if we save this and reopen Dungeon Draft, we're going to find that the green has been affected for both the walls and the pattern shapes, but the blue is only on the pattern shape level. And again, we can see here. On the green, this is a much lighter green. You can tell by the preview down here. And it has this 182 value for red and blue. And so that's what we expect. But the blue here is still 0 red, 0 green, 255 blue. Whereas the blue here on pattern shapes is that lighter colored blue. And that affected not only the 100% opacity blue, but also this lower opacity blue. So as long as your find and replace is able to find that trailing part of the hex code, you can replace it. So that's a good tip if you're using, say, puddles or something that have different levels of opacity maybe, but have the same color shift. And now we're going to go through and demonstrate that opacity difference with objects themselves. So I'm going back into my text editor, and here I have all of my hex codes for these objects slightly differently from the stock full red, full blue setup that I have on the other ones, just so this would remain unaffected and we could have a nice, easy change. Uh, you'll also notice that on this level, there are terrains. And if I wanted to switch dirt with something else, I could either swap in that file path, or I could switch between texture one and texture two by just renaming what those are. And that would also flip their distribution within the map. So going back here, I have this hex code that I'm going to change. This is a red-ish hex code. And I'm just going to adjust that following the same process we did earlier with the blue and the green. And I'm going to speed this up a bit as I'm a little indecisive on how I want these hex codes to look. So I'm going through really quickly and making some different changes to not only the red, but some of the other colors on this particular level. And you'll notice that now I bring up my notepad that has the extra hex codes. Uh, this is a really great example of why you want to copy down those hex codes. It's a lot easier to go through and tinker with things if you know what you're looking for to begin with, instead of having to scroll through and find them. So I've actually opted to, instead of taking like this near blue and near green, I am instead going to change them all to actually being the exact color. And while I'm doing all that, I ultimately decide to go back and make them a much lighter color. And the way that I've chosen to do that is, again, with that whole select the entire area. And I can also adjust only 
opacity specific versions if I want to just by using that eight digit hex code instead of the six digit hex code. So again, we're gonna go into our level zero and we've seen that with layers and everything and we are going to go through and select just our objects here. Again, you could use code folding to simplify this a little bit or just scroll down depending upon how large this file is. And here I'm turning this into the lighter colored hex codes so that they stand out a little bit more because it's probably a little harder to tell the difference between that near red and red versus near red and a closer to a pink color that I'm going to get with these changes in hex codes. So I'm going through and replacing all of those. So this is a good little breakdown of how you can change a lot of different things. And it's a lot faster to then iterate on this within the text editor rather than opening up the map and making all these changes individually. Returning to Dungeon Draft, we can see now that all of our hex codes and colors for these objects have been updated. I must have missed one here with my selection process, but that's okay, we can fix that. Um, and we'll notice that these are all the lighter colors that I specified, and everything has been changed. It doesn't matter what the object type is, whether it's this plant or it's those blankets. And again, we'll see that none of these other pieces have changed because I made sure to keep things isolated when I had changed it to a hex code that matched these other levels. And so we've gotten a nice, easy option there. Another really important function of text editing is removing embedded images like permanently from your map. If you're not familiar, in Dungeon Draft, you can drag in any JPEG or PNG or WebP into a map and drop it in like it's an object. This is a map that I made for myself and my campaign in Wonder Draft. And we'll notice that before I save, the D text editor example is only 400 kilobytes, while the image is a megabyte. Once I save though, let's take a look at the file sizes now. It is now a whopping 12 and a half, gig, uh, 12 and a half megabytes. It's nearly 13 megabytes, so that is almost, or that is over 10 times larger than the image itself. Now, if I delete it and I save and open up the files again, we'll see that that size didn't change because it's being stored in the embed information of the map file. So the only way to reduce our file size again is to open up the text editor for this map. And you'll see that it loads a lot slower than it did before because there's so much more data in this JSON. We collapse everything and go back into our world in the embedded section. You'll notice there's this new object that is specifying where my map came from, that image that I dropped in, and it's a lot of data. And it takes a little bit for it to delete. I also need to make sure that I am closing out my squiggly brackets. I accidentally left one in, and so I'm going to take care of that. And that way now the embedded file is truly gone and when I save this it is going to be significantly smaller. It's still a little larger and that's partially due to where I've already made other changes before saving but it is no longer 13 megabytes so it's a huge file savings. This is another good instance of why you need to make sure you're using as few embedded images as possible. Over here, I also want to show you another powerful trick with the text editor. If I go into any of my levels here, you'll notice in layers, we have all of these specified layers. Not included are the system specific ones, such as negative 500 for terrain, zero for water, 500 for portals, and 600 for walls. But we can add in our own by copying and pasting one of these others, such as below ground. And I'm going to make it negative 600 and rename it to below terrain. And a lot of times in this area just below your walls or just above your walls, you need a little more space to add depth on the top of cabinets. So I'm adding in this layer 450 called masking. As long as you don't pick a number that's already been taken by the system for an existing user layer or a system layer, again, like water, terrain, walls, and portals, and roofs, then you can add as many additional layers as you have numbers available. So now if I go to my objects layer, we can see now that all of these layers I just specified, that below terrain and that masking, they're available to pick and I can place things on it just like they were a normal layer. 
This is really powerful for highly detailed maps or maps where you want to use, say, the roofing tool and add extra detail above it. And we can see that I place those objects on my below terrain layer. And when I turn the terrain tool off, then they're visible. When I turn it back on, the terrain covers them up. This is also really helpful if you're wanting to use some pattern shapes to kit bash in a unique or elegant way. Normally, the hierarchy of objects on a layer goes pattern shapes are covered by paths, are covered by objects. So with this pattern shape and object on the exact same layer, the object is always going to be above the pattern shape. And if I put in a path like a carpet, we'll notice that it covers the pattern shape, but the object then covers the path. And if we zoom in, we can see this in action a little bit more clearly. Again, pattern shape is covered by path, is covered by object. And that is true no matter what layer you're on. So if you wanted to use a pattern shape or a path to selectively cover part of an object, you might need an extra layer to do that. And that's where this really comes in handy. Because I can create this new pattern shape on my layer 450 to cover objects and paths that are on layer 400. So it's a very useful trick for those detailed maps, like I was mentioning. I commonly am wanting to build some more interesting scenes or clutter up above wall layers or on top of cabinets that sit just below walls, but I can't really work with layer 400 to give the right shadow depth I want. Or if I need to do things on top of a roof, it's hard to cram those in. So adding in these extra layers is what lets you create more depth in your maps. I definitely wouldn't recommend going through this process for every map that you do, but on those situations where you need extra detail in these kind of weird middle grounds, it's a great trick. Now that we've seen all of these possibilities with the text editor, let's put some of them into action. Here we have the tower, which is available as a part of the Dungeon Draft archive on the BaileyWiki Patreon. And within it, you can see there's a lot of different layers here and there's some colors, there's a theme of blue throughout this, and there's this exterior that runs through the entirety of it with a specific pattern shape and wall. And with all of these layers, I'm going to radically change the look of the tower in just a few minutes using the text editor. Another great part of the tower is that BaileyWiki has included this text file on the right here, which is the motif guide that includes a lot of these main hallmark pieces for changing the look of the tower. So we have the color scheme up here, which is going to affect a lot of different things, and BaileyWiki has already specified some different points. The first thing I'm going to do is change the color scheme. I want to make it a green look, and again, I'm going to change this to be reading in JSON, so I get my nice code folding to make things easier to navigate. It's optional, but it really does help with being able to move around and I'm gonna find what color scheme we're on. If I didn't already know what it was, I would follow this process of using find and seeing if any of these color scheme codes pop up. I'm remembering now that it's definitely a blue, so if I go and find blue, there it is, and I can replace that with whatever color I want, and green has already been specified for this theme change by BaileyWiki, so really easy. And if I replace all, that is going to change all 715 different assets that use that blue code as part of the themes here. We've also got this wood and I'm going to uh, lighten that up a little bit with a different code. I'm going to use that B6, B6 option again. And so the wood will now be lightened up a little bit. And then I want to change the look of this scrying pool. If we're going for a green look, then I think maybe a blue is appropriate. So I am going to change that up. And what I'm doing for the scrying pool, if it's already in amber, I can use this hex code as somewhat of a template for myself. I know that FF is 255 out of 255 for the red value. And the CC is a fairly high value for green. And the 55 is a fairly low value for blue. 
If I want to then change this into more of a blue or a cyan color, I can just flip the proportion of red to blue. Of course, I realize now that I put that in the wrong spot. I want to make those changes to the replace with rather than the find what, but that's an easy enough fix. So this is another great option. If you're not sure what color you want to go for, you can then make some educated guesses within the hex editor without even opening Dungeon Draft. And again, I'm just going to swap where the red and the blue values are on the light elements in the scrying pool. And just changing that is going to give me a really radically different feel without having to do a lot of thinking or tinkering and changing things. It's going to keep a very similar feel in terms of the intensity of the color. It's just going to shift the color and hue to something different. I'm also looking through, I know the solid G wall is used a lot. I'm considering changing that to change up the look. And so I'm just making sure where that is, but I don't know exactly what I would change it with yet. So I'd want to tinker with that in my map. I'm ultimately not going to change the file path for the walls, but I will be changing the colors of them. And to do that, I am going to tinker around in Dungeon Draft to find what I like. The process would be very similar for finding a hex code I want or a file that I want. So here we're opening up Dungeon Draft again, and we're going to take a look at how that theme change has looked. You can already see in the bedroom, there's a lot of different colors that have changed with the bedspread. The stairs have changed. And going down, certain levels have more or less influence, like the lab has these green energies. And our scrying pool looks great with this cyan kind of color instead of amber. Really changes the look. And the dining room also really pops with this green instead of the blue. And scrolling down, we see that that change has affected all of the layers. So really radically different change already. But I'm not satisfied with this. I want to also change the exterior look. So I pull up this hex code. I can see the exterior uses this flagstone texture and these outer walls. I want to change the look a bit and give it kind of a sandstone feel. So here, I don't know a hex code off the top of my head that would look good with this, so I'm going to play around in Dungeon Draft to find the hex code I want. So I think this one looks good and gives kind of that red sandstone vibe that I like. And for my own ease, I'm going to add a new category. As you can see, these are different options for motifs on the outside of how to change out the exteriors. And again, I'm going to use that same texture. So then I'm just going to change the hex code behind it. And for the walls, I need to find a new one for that. It's probably not going to work with the exact same hex code that I'm using for the pattern shape. And you can also see that with how BaileyWiki has it a different hex code for his texture. So we're going to play around with it a little bit. Uh, I can use the slider or I can just click around. And after fiddling, I eventually settle on one that I like that really gives me the red sandstone vibe or almost an earthenware look as well. So it's kind of flexible in that regard. Whatever process you use, just find something that you're happy with. And once you have it, then copy that over to your notepad. And this will also be useful again if you're making a new level and you want to reuse some of these same assets, like the same wall type, you'll know exactly what the wall was and you'll know exactly what hex code you used on the other levels without having to go back through and click and find it. And I just want to check on these other exterior pieces and they use that same hex code that BaileyWiki used for the exterior originally, even though they're a different texture. So that's going to be affected by these changes to the exterior on the, on the tower base itself. So I don't need to come up with new hex codes for those that are already going to be affected. Going back into text editor, I will use my find and replace. And I'm going to use that original hex code that BaileyWiki provided in this text key. And I'm going to replace it with the new hex code that I found in light that I've already done on my first layer. And I'll replace all of them. And I will replace all of the wall hex codes with my new one to match the motif. This was really simple. It was really fast to go through this. And 
The only thing I've cut out of this process on changing the tower was literally the loading times for Dungeon Draft. I have made this tower radically different and fitting a very different theme, as we'll see here in just a second when we open it back up in Dungeon Draft. These changes are immense and make it feel like a completely new map with very little effort. And we can see this has so much more of an earthy feel. This almost looks more like a druid's tower now rather than um, some wizard's tower. Maybe skip out on some of the torture type things, or maybe I make a new level that has some of some alchemy or earthy or nature theme to it rather than the laboratory. But you can see this has really changed the look and feel of the castle, and this has only taken me a few minutes. So thanks so much for watching, and I hope that this really shows you the power that you can get out of just editing your maps with the text editor rather than having to go through manually select and change things. And I hope it really speeds up your map making and adds some new tools to your toolkit, such as adding those extra layers to get depth where you need it, and also ways to add in new themes or create additional variants of your maps quickly and efficiently. Text editing is one of these things where I think people really underestimate how powerful it is. And if you take nothing else from this video, take this notepad that we specify the specific assets that we're using and the hex codes so that you can replicate your work on other levels easily and efficiently without having to go back and cross-reference. Even if you never use text editing on your maps, that one trick alone is going to save you a lot of time. Once again, this has been Zephyr. Thanks for watching and happy map making.